Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we will be talking about INFP careers. And so Paul, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Sure, Joyce, thank you. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Paul, uh, an INFP. Uh, my current job is a marketing coordinator for an engineering firm. Uh, I do not have a background in marketing or anything like that. I do have a psych degree, which is, I guess, tangentially marketing related. Uh, yeah, and it's really enjoyable, but I've had like any number of random jobs, like first job, uh, delivering newspapers, uh, second job, washing dishes, very stimulating. And uh, I've worked in, worked in bookstores uh, for several years, although my shortest bookstore job, I left after one month due to stress. Ironically, it was a self-help bookstore. Uh, <laughs> it's funny now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, other random jobs. Uh, I've worked as, I mean, I've done like plenty of temp clerical work, worked as guest services in a hotel. Uh, I was a bus conductor in London for about three months, which uh, was very different. Probably the most physical, aside from washing dishes, probably the most physical job I ever did. Uh, yeah. Anyway, here I am. Thank you. Here you are, here you are. Well, thank you, Paul, for entering this panel and being your comedic self. Ian, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Yeah, my name's Ian. Um, right now I'm a system administrator for Windows machines. And before that, I, I've had several odd jobs as well um, from being a editor located in someone's house to um, working as an assistant manager at a fast food restaurant, so. Thank you for sharing. Ian is a kind soul. And Dana? I too have had many jobs and my current incarnation of work is the uh, oddest configuration, I guess. I started out, well, as a kid babysitting from the time I was like 11 years old, which, you know, now I'm nobody would leave an 11 year old with their infant. <laughs> but um, I was a bank teller through college in the summers. And I let's see what was next. Oh, then I was a nanny. Then I went back to school and uh, for a teaching degree, I taught first grade and then second grade for a total of five years. Then I was a nanny again. And then was after that oh i worked in property management and after that i worked at mostly keeping but some other stuff and then i was a um biller for insurance and personal for a eye clinic and then i finally quit that thank goodness i stopped doing all of those things and now i organize people's homes i do child care at my church two mornings a week and I am a part-time preschool administrator. Uh, oh, and also I do, um, I am a writer and haven't done much writing in the last couple of years, but uh, editing, I also do. So copy editing type work. Heck yes. And Dana did the INFP personality type episode with Personality Hacker too. If you want to check it out, I'll link it below. And DJ? Hi, I'm DJ. Um, I'm also in the Enneagram, uh, a nine. Um, as far as my job history, it's it's been pretty varied. Um, like ranging from working on an alpaca farm to caring for disabled adults to washing dishes at a retirement home. And uh, I had an, an associate's degree in marketing and completed a couple internships. That was pretty fun. And right now, um, I work probably the best way to understand. I'm not going to use the company title, but is a mail clerk right now. But really, um, kind of becoming more of a like a clerical generalist. So, cool. Yeah, thanks for that, DJ and Leon. Hi, I'm I'm Leon, and I never worked a day of my life. Neat. <laughs> and then uh, I worked in food services before, and I worked in a greenhouse. I worked in a furniture store for two and a half days. 
And um, obviously that was not a favorite. Uh, otherwise I would have stuck around with that one. My favorite ones is anything that has to do with working with people, especially in a capacity of helping them out in some sort of way. So my favorite ones are being tutor, being a teaching assistant, um, and currently being a mental health counselor as well. Um, I've also worked as a research assistant too, which um, I, I worked on studies that were exciting on paper. Sweet. There's a career interest inventory called the Strong, and you'll see a lot of INFPs scoring around the artistic and social areas, which means that, you know, Leon mentioned how he likes jobs where he gets to help people. So that's the social in the strong interest inventory. And you'll also see INFPs also gravitating towards artistic fields too, depending on the person. And maybe a little bit of an investigative too in the inventory too, because of the introspective nature of the type. All right. Very cool, Leon. You have the stereotypical INFP job. I'm the ultimate INFP square. Absolutely. Yeah. And Paul has the most classical INFP education, which is he went to school for psychology. And it's that's like the NF stereotypical career. And so Leon has a YouTube channel called Type Tips. And so feel free to check it out. He has a lot of tips on the INFP personality type and other types too. And Anne? Sure. So like Paul, I have the um, psychology degree. Um, I, I, you guys are all making me feel a whole lot better about my crazy, convoluted, circuitous career. Um, and Dana, I liked what you said, current incarnation, because that just seems to be the theme. Like, you know, what's your current? Well, today, like, you know, but um, I have a master's degree in counseling psychology. Um, I'm a board certified coach and MBTI master practitioner, and I'm a certified MTIC practitioner, which is the, um, the uh, official type indicator assessment for children. Um, so my company Thrive Dynamics is what I call a people development consultancy. Um, and I offer coaching and consulting training services to leaders, teams, career advancers, students, and families. And with this, my perspective in everything I do um, is to utilize typology and particularly a depth typology perspective. Um, but it hasn't been a straight shot to get here, like anybody's. Um, and I really know that if I had had the insights that come with knowing my type when I was younger, um, my career path would have been much less circuitous. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. So right out of college, um, I started my career in the hospitality industry, some management, but primarily sales and marketing. I did not study for that in college. I just landed into that. So typical INFP thing. Um, and in my late 20s, I went off on my own working as a freelance consultant in the tourism industry, doing uh, marketing promotions, project management and event production. Um, meanwhile, I went back to school to get my master's in counseling psychology. And from then on, I maintained a kind of dual career, um, continuing to do tourism work, but then also working with career counseling outplacement firms and then doing executive coaching and management consulting with a boutique consulting firm. And that's all until I founded um, my current company, Thrive Dynamics, several years ago, which came about just from years and years and years, a um, couple of decades, really, about studying about type and, uh, you know, wanting that to be the center of what I did, but use, utilizing all the other knowledge and stuff that I've acquired through the years. Uh, but that's me. Heck yeah. And Anne is also creating a website called Depth Typology that I'll be interviewing her on someday. So stay tuned for that. It's some John BB goodness. And so, hi, my name is Joyce. I'm a certified MBTI master practitioner and I facilitate the instrument in organizations. I help people on the journey of figuring out their best fit type and I coach them as well. All right. It's quite awesome to have a bunch of INFPs here and to see a little bit of the bantering back and forth. So I noticed when I talk to INFPs, sometimes they'll say words like sarcut sarcutic sorry. <laughs> I can pronounce this, I swear. Well, only we can pronounce it. Circuitous. <laughs> yeah, we can pronounce it because we use it so much. <laughs> 
<laughs> circuitous. Yes. It's just a funny little INFP quirk I hear because I don't hear other people using those words in daily language, but I hear INFPs saying those words. And so I would love to know your experience at work. So how are you like at work and how do you think it differs from other types? Maybe I could say something. Okay, so I think, and you know, maybe not all INFPs necessarily agree, um, but uh, we often have a lot, like one of our strengths is that we have a lot of passion um, and the second one is like the, the passion and idealism, and then we could uh, be very flexible too. And I think, you know, maybe we start off, the problem is that we don't have like much of a plan, right? So that's why we kind of go like this, right? But like, um, I think, uh, yeah, I think that's important. Like it's not, it's important not to under count um, passion because uh, if you talk with like other types, they might actually uh, really appreciate those qualities and they, you know, they wish they could have more of that. And, you know, it could be difficult at times, like if we are in a job and, you know, the passion's not there. I love that you started out with the positive, Leon, because I tend to be, um, I, I mean, I, I work on being an optimistic, positive person, but um, I, usually think oh i am not as fill in the blank as i guess estj i would think of you know as a typical like i don't i just don't think business e it's a real stretch for me and i tend to feel very um naive a lot of times i think in business situations and particularly, I suppose, because I've never worked in any kind of corporate. Um, I've worked in small businesses when I have worked for people. So I tend to have the viewpoint that INFP, um, or at least my version of it, is pretty, um, it's all personal for me. And I have to work real hard to remember that, you know, sometimes business is business and it really truly isn't personal it's just if we don't have a bottom line then none of us is going to be employed kind of thing so that's my take yeah it's a very valid take and so i'm wondering how easy was it for you infps if you charge for your own services to actually ask for money or to create your own prices or to get into that business mindset of I'm going to have to charge you $200 for my services. Did it take time to do that? Because Dana was mentioning about how it was hard to get into that business mindset and money mindset. I still struggle with it. And I have an INTJ friend in particular who's constantly telling me, you need to charge more. Well, uh, I think that that question gets at the heart of having dominant FI. Um, you know, I don't know if it's the same for ISFPs, but... Uh, and, and this kind of ties together what Leon said and what Dana said, and that's, um, uh, so Dana was talking about, you know, feeling um, maybe less than or whatever in, t in comparison to like an ESTJ in a workplace situation. And so FI really kind of always tracks the gap, um, as I call it, it tracks the gap between what's happening now, the current situation, what, what the ideal would be for that. So, and the other part of it is that in order to understand anything or learn anything, you know, we take in the information, you know, we've got this, this NE that's all over the place, but we have to take everything inside of ourselves. So it's a complete opposite of like uh, TI or even, or TE, which needs to like step away from it, you know, and get some distance to like think about it. We have to like literally ingest anything and run it through our our ourselves, you know, internally and and take it in and and you know and 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 play with it. And so um, uh, that part, you know, but that that tracking the gap between the the actual the real and the ideal i think that that uh affects you know uncomfortableness with charging because 
we can always see um, improvement. We can always see, you know, the stretch and we don't, we haven't met that. So if we're, if we're not at the ideal level, if we haven't mastered something, if we don't think we are the absolute expert, which we never probably will, then we're not um, worthy or, you know, our value doesn't match whatever that is. So it's learning that that's really not the formula. And at least for me, it's, you know, I'm older and it's taken a lot of decades to get to the point of recognizing that doesn't have to be the formula to get more comfortable with charging, um, you know, um, market value fees. You bring up good points. And, and so you mentioned tracking the gap. And so I wonder if that makes INFP susceptible to disenfranchisement or feeling disillusioned at their jobs. Because if you can always see the gap between what is ideal and what is now, then it's going to create a level of dissatisfaction or a level of not reaching that ideal that you might see in the workplace jobs that you have. And so I think maybe that's why INFPs might be a little bit more prone to depression because it's like when you notice the gap all the time, then that's not always good for mental health. It is good for making the world a better place because you notice how it could be a better place and how you could be a better person, but it's not good for uh, self-esteem or happiness sometimes. And so it's interesting. We talked a little bit about ESTJs and INFPs in this chat. And Paul is actually married to an ESTJ. So I'm wondering, how do you see you approaching work differently than your spouse? Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Joyce. Yeah, it's a great question. I was actually thinking about that, you know, especially with, you know, <laughs> the discussion of TE and, you know, its relation to the business world, because, you know, especially at least in North America, the business world, you know, loves TE. It's, it's all about goals and effectiveness and stuff. And it's really great. I feel very lucky that uh, my wife, Erin, who is an ESTJ, also a three uh, <laughs> on the Enneagram, uh, whereas I'm a nine, by the way, uh, like you, DJ. And I've, I find it helps that she's done a lot of work on herself and her FI, I find she actually does hold fair bit of space for because uh, she works uh, for the government and she's committed. She's an environmental sustainability manager, which is one of her personal values. She actually, you know, was a huge influence on me and my own relationship to caring about the environment and, you know, what can we do better? Because I was doing the standard, like, oh, I put my cans in the recycling bin. I helped. <laughs> Yay me. Um, yeah, just like really working towards like more uh, powerful changes. And she's been a huge advocate for me in basically sticking up for myself in my own work, because oftentimes I wouldn't talk about her work. Whereas typical TE Dom, she would come home and talk about all the idiots she's had to deal with <laughs> for various reasons. Um, I'm stereotyping a bit there. It's not quite that, but uh, I held back a lot and she's really helped me open up. Uh, I find like, I, th I guess all types when they're healthy and I've, I feel Erin is a pretty healthy ESTJ. Uh, they can be such a wonderful advocate for each other, especially when they're coming from opposite sides of the spectrum, regardless of type, just like a healthy ESTP for you, Joyce, as an INFJ, I, th I imagine would be wonderful. Um, and, she, you know, they really help you like, like they understand, okay, you, where you come from, how you think and feel is very different from where I am, but it's not so alien that I don't understand it because I do have that little part. I do have that little bit of, uh, you know, FI and I do have a, you know, little bit of NE, for example, we're just flipped on each other. And so she understands that uh, my personal value is like, I'm not about making money, for example, uh, so she finds things for me to care about where it's like, well, it's great if you can make more money, uh, but here's how you can do it in a way where you feel authentic, where it's more about making sure you feel valued, like not just in terms of what you're earning, but in terms of like, well, how do people feel about your contributions at work? And uh, like, here's why you should speak up for them because you have a lot to say and you have a lot to think about. And it's very easy for you to, uh, you know, just sit back and let people tell you what to do all the time. 
it's still something I struggle with, to be perfectly frank. Um, and <laughs> you mentioned depression, Joyce. I actually do uh, have depression, uh, mild, frankly, but it's it's been a struggle because it doesn't just go away when you're at work, unfortunately. Um, yeah, and sorry, I know I'm rambling a bit here, <laughs> which is a... Uh, Unfortunately, a side effect, at least of my communication style. But uh, anyway, anyway, I just find that having a really strong, uh, yeah, ESTJ in my case has has really helped me a lot in, you know, just strengthening my own position uh, when it comes to my work and my career and and where I fit in. I have some thoughts about um, so. Obviously, like I'm a piece of very idealistic type, right? And that that could be a very good thing. Um, and again, we're stronger at passion, maybe with the practical side of life and with consistency, that might be not as strong. But like um, I, um, the thing is, I all areas of life would include some element of both, right? There's the passion and there's also like the practical side and maybe with when it comes to work there's more emphasis on the practical side not saying that you can't get the the, the passion side in there but you have things outside of work like a, like for example hobbies and um maybe it's not as limited by practicality but it's it's still a helpful aspect so a lot of the things that we learn about in terms of expert thinking or interest sensing are going to be helpful with hobbies piece they establish like a baseline consistency, right? It's good to um, like passion to, to get you places. And it's very important not to under, underwrite that because a lot of types, they don't have that to drive them as strongly. But like when you have passion combined with like um, uh, practicality and consistency, then you could really build something, right? Um, out, outside of work. And that same thing is the same thing inside of work. So. Um, of, of course, at work, the priority is the practical aspect. And say that we end up in a job that's just like very practical and we're not passionate about, it. there's still something that we can learn from it, from that kind of job. We get some skills where we could build the, the practical abilities that would help with other areas of life. And then maybe down in the future, we could find something that we're more passionate about too. But even like, because I, I really much enjoy my job. I'm very passionate about it. There's still this element of uh, being consistent and also being practical that's always there, regardless, that needs to be addressed. That's a really good point, Leon. That consistency, finding the SI thing that you can build on for sure. And so I'm gonna pick on some of the INFPs that haven't been talking, uh, just cause I wanna include you guys in the conversation. And so DJ, there are some quirks that you have in the workplace. One of them is I noticed there are quite a few INFPs who are good writers. That includes DJ and Paul. I know that you guys spend like a side hobby of yours. Me too. Right? Yeah, Leon too. And it tends to be this really like FI introspective work where you read about the stuff that they've been thinking about in reference to their own growth and development and how it relates to this larger scheme of life in the human experience. And so it's the great thing about FI is that like you can take the individual experience and you can extrapolate it towards humans in general because your experience isn't just your experience. It's once you have wisdom about yourself through FI, you have wisdom about the entire collective of human species in a strange way. And so I find that when I read INFP writing through their intense level of introspection, it helps me gain clarity on, wow, that part that they described is also in me too and in other people and it's like mind blowing because it's so deep and rich. FI just has such a great deep rich inner world and it's a blessing to have INFPs share that through writing. But sometimes you'll meet INFPs who use their extroverted intuition in writing too and so they just make it comical a little bit with the little bits of connecting different things. And so DJ has these stories about him and something about buffaloes and woodpeckers. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, it was during one of my like um, internships at this technical college. I was a student there, and I interned as like a student editor. So um, a main part of that job was just like basically like being a proofreader. It was a very like journalistic style of writing, and I was 
partnered up with a woman who was actually like, she was returning. I think she was in her early fifties. I mean, she had a journalism degree. She worked at like, uh, where I am Wisconsin, like, like the, the top paper. So she was like an actual journalist with like decades of experience. Like she was a professional and I'm like a total greenhorn being paired up with her. And we always met with the director to talk about the newsletter that went out to the college and everything. And I don't remember what brought it up, but we were, he was just talking and I think he was just trying to be like, you know, like a good manager and give us both credit, but it was really like, obviously we're not contributing the same, she's a professional, like she's done it. I'm a total greenhorn. And I made a joke about like, you know, it's really uh, more like she's like a Cape Buffalo and I'm just an ox pecker on her back, like going along and picking bugs off of it and everything like that. You know, I'm not really doing anything. I'm just there for the ride. You know, she's the one who's doing all like the heavy lifting and everything. And um, yeah, it just sh like shot out of me saying like weird things like that. And then, uh, yeah, my director asked me if I was high and I was like, no, I'm not high. This is all natural. And then I realized right after I said it, it's like, oh, I just called this woman a buffalo. So it was like a really weird thing. Luckily, they both had a pretty good sense of humor about it. But it was just like, yeah, I guess that's another thing with like, like INFPs is, yeah, we can come off as strange just saying like weird metaphors, making like connections and, um, you know, you don't even plan it. You just say something and it's just like, oh, I just called this woman a buffalo. So. This is super, but you know, I didn't get any trouble or anything, but yeah, that's an example. Yeah, so that's how extroverted intuition can look like to other people sometimes. They're like, are you high? I know ENFPs especially get it because the extroverted intuition is dominant for them. But still, if you're an NP, you might get the occasional comment that, wow, how did you make that connection? What? <laughs> like people are like looking at you strange because of something you said. And you're like, oh, oops. <laughs> Joyce, I just wanted to say something based on what DJ said that um, about INFPs that I think a lot of people who aren't deep into type don't really know. So he said that his job was like as a proofreader. And um, that's something I've done at different times. And I wonder if a bunch of INFPs have done that. And I think it's pretty easy for INFPs to do it. And we're actually very good at it. And again, it's, but I don't think a lot of people would think that they might think it's more of a TE thing or so. I don't know. But, um, but again, I think it goes back to that. We, we, we notice what's wrong. We notice what's off, you know, it's that the gap thing again. And, um, it also makes us very good troubleshooters. Like we can go into an organization or into anything and we can troubleshoot and then we can come up with a lot of solution, creative uh, solutions. They might not be right on, but a lot of possibilities for solutions of how to, how to fix it. But we notice, again, the troubleshooting, pr proofreading is like troubleshooting. You know, it's the same thing, but it's just that quality of mind that I think comes from FI anchored by TE, you know, um, that a lot of people don't know about INFP or wouldn't really guess. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up. Proofreading, yes, also a job. And my sister actually also has INFP preferences and that is her, she's a copywriter, editor, whatever. And she will email me with just the nitpickiest little questions and we will go off together about them. And we had this full on conversation a while, a couple week ago about should there be an apostrophe in this one place? And, you know, all the other places in the company have it, but this one place that's most obvious doesn't and on and on and on. But I also think that for me personally, as part of my, quest against because I had depression horribly in my 20s and I mean I obviously people have had it way worse I was never actively suicidal but passively was <laughs> right there um, and I think I have consciously made a turn away from that to point to the point where um, I don't notice a lot of things and I think I've kind of focused it all on the proofreading type stuff like I it, it's for me somehow safe to see it in people's writing 
Um, now I do see it in organizational uh, situations, <laughs> pre, pre me having organized them, I can just look at things and be amazed at what people don't see. But I have really, um, and I find it so interesting and valuable you, that you brought that up because I had never thought about it, but I have channeled it, that ability or quality into safe places. And then I really try hard not to use it elsewhere, or I could see myself just going down into a spiral of not goodness. Um, and, and I think that works for me, but sometimes I think I lose a little, I, I think I could use it usefully in more areas maybe than I have tried so far. So I'm just going to keep that in mind for myself. <laughs> Yeah, and there's some introverted sensing being used in proofreading too, because you're critiquing details. And so I find that INFPs have a pedantic side to them sometimes. And so they're noticing, okay, that detail needs to be fixed. <laughs> like that, yeah. And the FI has a certain way that it wants it, because it's like, okay, I feel that this way is better than this way. And the TE is like, all right, I'm going to correct it. I'm going to do, do. So we're, we're, the, we're the ESTJ of the inner world. <laughs> So like, um, well, if you if you take a look at it, like I, I actually very much enjoy proofreading uh, myself and I like to, I really much enjoy writing. And I think one thing that I got stuck in is how to get things down perfectly, right? But being the ECG of the inner world, like if you look at like Chopin, for, exa <clears throat> for example, as a composer, like if things aren't perfect then he would just like burn his music. So it's, it's kind of like it's the ESTJ, but like in that inner, more creative realm, perhaps. Perfectionism is a huge INFP thing. If it's not perfect, then I feel inadequate about my own work. This is not good enough for anyone. Um, right. And so the thing is, I would say there that um, we would actually have the same problems of ESTJs just in that realm. So like kind of learning to kind of loosen that up and not strive for perfection. Uh, well, I think that would help get us uh, farther and feel more enriched. Yeah, I just want to say, Joyce, you brought up SI, you know, tertiary SI. When Dana was talking, I kept thinking about that, that, um, you know, that it, it, she's found the solution to just use that, those qualities in certain areas, because, you know, and then the whole thing of, you know, depression. I find that, you know, when SI gets overused and FI and SI kind of get used together too much, um, you can get dragged in, you can become obsessive about thing, you know, obsessive about perfection, what needs to be, you know, perfect, et cetera. And that is a slippery slope for INFP because that amount of focus, that amount of um, pressure for your tertiary function, for your child function, it, um, you can burn yourself out really easily. Like that function can't, you can't work it to death. And when we work it to death, because we put that pressure on and we get into anxiety, whatever, whatever, um, then it can it can be a slippery slope. So I think it's, you know, it's kind of just built into um, our code that way. And it's great to come up with strategies to um, be aware of that and then to, uh, you know, master using our, our, our stack to uh, to ward against it. So I really like that that solution. That was that was really cool. Yeah, sometimes using the TE as an own stick to punish yourself is quite the painful treatment to your yourself. And so, Ian, do you have any thoughts on this conversation? Feelings? Yeah, um, I I know like for like the last few, it's been what like a year, a year and a half now. My INFJ's been tr my INFJ's. <sighs> can't speak, sorry. <laughs> My INFJ friend has been really telling me that I need to, um, I need to finish my screenplay that I've been writing for like years. And um, each time, like I live with him now, so it's weird because he's like, have you finished it? Um, but yeah, I, I think it comes to the point where like for me, I know the dialogue is off. I know this is off. I know this is off. I know, like, I know 
it's kind of like seeing, like looking out into the void and seeing like all the different problems that no one else will probably see, but you see them. Um, it's a bit, yeah, it's, a, it's overwhelming at times, but it's, yeah. And you tell yourself that like, you need to just let it go. But how, how do you just let things go? I find that with um, the stupidest like emails that I send. Um, if I, if there's one word and I know the word that I want and the other part, you know, the TE part of me is like, this is dumb. Just get it out there because that's the important part. So Ian, I totally, and I do it with more important things because obviously your screenplay is way more important than an email to whatever. But I, and if anybody has any suggestions on how we can let those things go a little more easily, I would love to hear them because sometimes it's just, you know, I, I you just need to finish but how do you let it go enough to be able to finish? Yeah, so something I do to let go of perfectionism is um, kind of seeing everything that you create, it contains your essence. And so even if the details are off, it's okay. You can improve it later on, but it'll always have your scent on it or the people who are meant to enjoy your vibe or like you in your entirety will feel you through your work, no matter how imperfect it is. Like with the people that you love, you still love them even if they have warts on them or any other imperfection because you know that the core of them is beautiful. And so I find that you're depriving someone of experiencing you then it's like, wow, I really have to put this out because what if someone needed to experience what you had to offer and you're doing a disservice through not putting your energy into the world when someone might really benefit from having your existence projected more outwardly. And so emphasizing the tragedy that is the lost potential of not putting yourself out there helps overcome perfectionism because it's like, wow, someone will still like this even if it's not perfect because it's me and someone might have really needed to experience that. But it's hard to kind of value ourselves. So it's a hard mentality to internalize. That's really beautifully put, Joyce. Yeah, so I, I appreciate the, the introvert intuitive perspective. So that's something that we could um, we could benefit from in terms of taking the overall view of our essence right? and, and um, seeing that uh, people could appreciate being able to uh, from being able to gain from our energy like but by putting our energy out there I think there's also like the other aspect to kind of go along with introvert intuition there's also the expert sensing aspect too which is um, the expert sensing aspect is very weak in the INFP but the the whole idea of just ex just acting and doing and just experiencing things. I think that actually goes a long way. So I think for INFPs, we like to kind of perfectly conceptualize things first before acting or things have to be kind of perfect in our head. So like if you kind of take after ESTJs and ESF, I mean, sorry, if, if you take after ESTPs and um, ESFPs, not like you have to act like them, but something that we can learn from them is just to kind of like, experience for the sake of experience. And they don't even necessarily think about it as experience. They're just like kind of just doing things. And I, I find that that's um, half of getting to know yourself is just to act on things. And often we could form an idea in our head, but then when we actually do the thing, it's not us, right? And sometimes you do something and you think that's not you, but then it becomes your, uh, you realize it actually is an aspect of yourself. You guys have the opposite problem of the ESFPs and ESTPs. Like for them, they tend to experience things and then regret that they might have jumped in too quickly with certain experiences. Whereas like INFPs are so hesitant and cautious and perfectionistic that the regret is in not doing the thing and not putting out the screenplay, I think Ian mentioned. Yeah, so Joyce, uh, just to piggyback on what Leon, Leon said about what you said. So he was talking about, you know, how you're, you started with your, uh, introverted 
intuition, which I always find so yummy, you know, and just like taking this one point and broadening it out to like the infinite. But then, you know, the motivation, I mean, it was beautiful. And I just as an INFP, like I can connect with that, you know, um, you may be depriving other people of something, you know, you have a gem that, you know, even if you can, um, I'm totally paraphrasing and maybe not getting exactly what you said, but, um, but uh, depriving other people have, you know, might have a gem and, um, you know, like let go of the part that maybe isn't perfected yet. And you can perfect that later, blah, blah, blah. But that is very also FE, you know, because it's like, it's the focus is the other person. And even though we can connect to that, we're still going to be dogged and plagued by, you know, our FI and our SI. Like, it's still like, yeah, but like, it doesn't meet this internal standard. And it's not some intellectual thing. It's like what I said initially about like FI, we have to run everything through ourselves. It's a visceral, like gut level thing. And so you're like, you're like compelled to like not release something or whatever until it's at a certain point. Like it's like a real, like it can make you sick. Like it's like that kind of force. It's, it's a really powerful force. Um, so one of the, the, the suggestion, I mean, the thing that I've found to work with that is to, you know, engage more your extroverted intuition and then a little bit your extroverted thinking. And if you can, get together with people who you really trust. And of course, with FI, it's got to be people you really trust. So, you know, if it's Ian talking to, you know, about getting this piece of work out or any of us with any of our stuff, right? Like, it's like, um, you know, we hold back, we hold back, we hold back, but we know we have to get it out there. So, it, you know, if we can um, use our extroverted functions to discuss it with people to work it out because we also waste a lot of time just living it in our own heads and we don't know if it's there i mean we do from our own thing but we we have to get extroverted about it and so i've just felt like if i can use my extroverted intuition if i can talk to people um because then actually i if i can have a conversation a five-minute conversation with someone who knows what I'm talking about and who I really trust in my life, that can get me light years ahead in a project. Cause extroverted intuition, it's just like really fast. It moves very fast. Our thinking moves very fast and um, it can really help move us along. And then if we can kick in a little bit of extroverted thinking to structure it and get it done, you know, that helps to balance the inner struggle. Um, and uh, you know, and then, and then there's, you know, the whole, um, a psychological concept of good enough. You know, there's this thing, the good enough mother, the good enough thing. And it, we struggle with that. I mean, the struggle is real, but if we can, you know, over time, as we get older, like really start to embrace that, that helps. That really helps too. And then the ESTJs and ENTJs are like, good enough. That's awesome. All right, let's move forward. <laughs> I have some thoughts. Uh, I'll, I'll, I think uh, I could draw from um, a personal example. So like in terms when I mentioned about like we might kind of form an idea about something in our heads about who we are. So from my own personal example is that ever since high school, I always wanted to get a PhD. Um, so I geared my whole entire life towards that goal kind of and while well, ignoring uh, uh, evidence to the contrary that that's not who I am because that's something that I was like very passionate about. And I think, um, you know, there's the structure of school and college. And the thing is, so long as you kind of like get your degrees and you get onto the next stage. And I think everyone probably experiences to extent, like um, you get kind of babied by the system. But like with um, with INFPs, I guess it's almost as if you're, you have expert thinking there already. So there's like a structure out there that would provide, that's given to you so that you get to where you need to go. So, um, with the structure of school, I just could just feel like do what I need to do in order to get the PhD. And then uh, when I actually got into the PhD program, you know, you have to think about this is like years later after I first like envisioned about getting a PhD, I absolutely hated it. Like it's like, and uh, I, I, I suffer from a pretty deep depression because I had my whole identity hell bent on, on this, uh, this idea of who I am. 
And so, um, and, but anyway, I think the idea is like, um, afterwards I, I learned to kind of be open to things as in like open to like figuring myself out in other ways. Sometimes uh, I can't just trust, like I, if, if I fall through with the system, it's going to get me to where I want to go. Right. Is that like, I need to learn how to do planning myself or to get organized just for my own life to kind of figure out what my next step is. And um, and also to be more exploratory and to be more open. That's kind of what Anne was talking about with the expert intuition. I think that kind of makes up for the expert sensing in a way, like ex expert sensing is about acting. So long as you have that intellectual curiosity with expert intuition and you kind of chase that a bit that almost becomes like expert sensing and then to to explore and and get to know yourself a bit better then then i then i'm able to find myself more in line much more in line with um who i am in terms of what i'm doing yeah so it's quite interesting in your head you might think that you really want something but once you actually experience it you're like huh this PhD program isn't like I thought it would be like, because I wonder if there's this limerence in your head, this like, wow, it's going to be so great if I get my PhD. And then when you actually put yourself through the ringer, you're like, I hate this. And so sometimes the extroverted intuition or just trying it and seeing what happens will tell you whether or not it's actually made for you. Because there's a trap that you can fall into, which is just like having the idea in your head and it seems so, so perfect. And then reality testing is something that INFPs might benefit from. And it's like, oh, okay, this is the reality of it. And it might really be heartbreaking sometimes the reality of it too. But yeah. And so my next question for everyone is, what is your leadership style? I run a, a couple of groups a week. So I run a, like a group for a workshop for social anxiety. And I also run a depression support group every every week. And I think um, I think for a lot of INPs, INPs have the potential to have be an inspirational leader, right? I guess the issue is that we're very quiet about it. So I I remember a teacher when I was back in elementary school or, or was it elementary school middle school, and she said like uh, Leon has a lot of great ideas like in terms of like writing, but I never we never hear about it in class, right? So I think we have ideas that. Uh, do in, do inspire people. If you look at like a lot of like famous sign of peas, like if you look at like George Lucas, for example, um, he's he was like he's very quiet in a way, but I think people are very inspired by his ideas. So like sign of peas, often um, they find a way to talk about the human condition, but in a way that people could understand. So that you can look at in terms of the work of George Lucas, for example, and um, and I think we have good ideas, but we have to trust that we do. I think we might have poor self-esteem, so we don't like talk about it, or it's not perfect enough as we don't talk about, it, but it's it's there. We, and we have that potential to be inspirational. I find, too, when I was younger, like I think when I was teaching, I ended up being sort of a leader of a couple of teams that I was on. And I felt like I was pretty good at it. And I, you know, was able to get, I felt like I was able to get everybody feel, to feel like they were being heard and um, that their ideas and input were valuable. And we also could get things done. And then I left teaching and didn't do anything that I saw as leadership for a long time. And then the next, specific time I remember being sort of a leader was in uh, one of my, um, well, in the child care center at my church doing organizing and curriculum for one of the programs that we do. And, um, oh my gosh, it was, you know, that whole thing of TE when it's in the fourth position and you might be really good at one part of it, but you really just can't transfer that to anything else. I felt so bumbling and um, like I, and it could have been a little bit because of the team I was dealing with, because there was one 
person in particular that I kind of struggle with. But I think in that particular situation, we are all so nice. I mean, we work at a church, so it's all feelers. And um, you don't want to tell anybody what to do if they don't really want to do it. And um, But I was kind of like, well, I know what I'm doing. And the struggle was really to share the fact that I know what I'm doing with the fact that I need to direct people. And how do I do that in a way that is um, just not so clumsy as I felt. And I kind of had a point here, but my, my aging brain just went, poof, I don't know what it was. Um, so I'll stop now. <laughs> I think as a leader, uh, you know, being an INFP brings with it, um, well, first of all, I mean, FI is just like the listening function, right? It's like every you know, just a, a superpower to be able to listen and listen very deeply, um, you know, listen to the context underneath what is being said, you know, and really just take in, you know, it's almost people with INFPs almost have the experience of, uh, you know, just being validated and um, being really understood uh, just from listening, um, you know, while often make great therapists and things like that. Uh, So making sure everyone is heard, like Dana said, you know, I think is an INFP leadership quality. Um, That's very important to me in any leadership position is making sure, you know, the inclusivity part, making sure everybody feels included, making sure um, everybody feels heard and validated, even if, uh, you know, whatever their idea is or whatever isn't going to be the way that we end up going or whatever, just everyone has the opportunity to participate and to voice uh, whatever they want to want to share. So I I think that is definitely always there with an INFP leader. And then like Leon said, you know, inspirational, I think for INFPs, you know, similar to, you know, NI functions, it's like, we, we hold a vision. So if we're in a leadership position, you know, we have that idea of, what we're doing, where we're going, what, like what the vision is that we're trying to um, accomplish. Uh, And so that's the inspiration. I think, I think our vision creates, if people can buy, if people buy into the vision or if we can get people to see what we see or see it in the way that they see it, you know, really, actually that's the buy-in is we have a vision, but they can see it and, and participate in it and get motivated and inspired by it in their own way um, and through their own type, um, then, uh, you know, I, th- I think that's a quality that we bring to leadership is that we can be visionary leaders that, that the vision then inspires people. Um, so, you know, and then we could talk about all the challenges we have as leaders, but I mean, there's a lot of those. Um, and we just, I think, at least for me, it's just age, you know, and experience, just decades of getting over myself and, you know, recognizing like, for instance, you know, we can be really shy in certain levels or like not reluctant in terms of communication. Right. And, and so I'm constantly pushing myself thinking, you know, I've got to get more communicate, communicate more. Like I think if, if I'm like totally overdoing it, if I'm communicating at 200%, that's like, normal for a lot of people or even less than normal. So I'm always like pushing, like being aware of what those shortcomings are and what other people type helps me to understand what other types need, what other people need so that I'm not always using myself as the reference point, which is the INFP problem, right? That's FI dominant. You use yourself as a reference point for everything. Well, Type gives you the opportunity to know that that's not the good, you know, focus group of one is like not going to get you anywhere. So um, knowing what other people need, then I can push myself to use my less dominant functions um, as best as I can to get other people's needs met in that way. And that requires, you know, for me to be an FE a lot. 
um, you know, to what other people need and accommodating them. And, you know, that's my opposing personality. And it's like, you know, if I get, if I'm there too much or too long, I get, I get gnarly, right? Like I get like almost like in a hangry mood, right? So, uh, you know, so it's understanding it, using what you can, but tempering it. So at least for me, that's, that's how it kind of works. Yeah, we'll put Anna and Dana. So you you both brought up the point of um, INFPs offer the gift of making other people feel heard through their deep listening. Great. And so anyone else want to add on to INFP leadership skill sets? Yeah, I'll just say that leadership, especially in like the more traditional sense, it's always been something I've really struggled with because for the longest time, I would just deny myself any opportunity because I'd excuse it by, by saying, oh, I don't want to tell people what to do. I'm not comfortable with that. Um, and like, who the hell am I? All that kind of stuff. I mean, there's certainly a bit of imposter syndrome uh, coming into it. Uh, actually, speaking of that, I was recently invited to join a fairly select group of like marketing professionals, like from all over where they're like, yeah, we're going to create this new initiative and stuff. And it's like, and I'm like looking at all these people on LinkedIn. It's like, these people are really accomplished and stuff. I'm like, look what they've done. And like, they're entrepreneurs and stuff. And like, like, like the most entrepreneurial thing I did was be an astrologer for a few months. And like, even then I hardly got paid for it. Uh, <laughs> and that was ages ago. And like when we were doing our intros, like I actually felt very vulnerable around them. And I said, I was like, listen, uh, my imposter syndrome is flipping tables right now because which it's a wonderful environment. They're all very supportive and a lot of them like really related to things like that. So, which I think is easy to lose sight of. Like uh, I remember I follow Neil Gaiman on uh, Twitter and he recounted a story where he was invited to a group. I'm not sure if Neil Gaiman is an INFP. I could certainly see him as an INFP, uh, but he recounted a, a role where like he was like in a group, he was invited like, and these are like, these are the like, movers and shakers in terms of ideas and passions and like extremely accomplished people. And Neil Gaiman, who is like a wonderfully prolific writer and creator is standing there thinking like, like who the hell am I, right? And stuff. And then he taught, he mentions talking to like a very nice older gentleman who was, you know, very polite and and stuff, and they talked a bit about how, oh yeah, your name is Neil too, and, and stuff like that. And then this person, the other Neil, was saying, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing here. Like, who are these people? And like, I I just went where I was told. And Neil Gaiman says to him, it's like, well, yes, but you're also the first person on the moon. I think that counts for something. So yeah, he's talking to Neil Armstrong and Neil Armstrong feels like a fraud. Uh, so I think it's just very helpful to remember that plenty of people, even like the more traditional leaders we have, often feel like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, you know, like, why should people listen to what I think? And I think it, I think it's helpful to remember things like that, that I know INFPs often feel like, oh gosh, like, you know, like I'm not good enough. I, my stuff isn't perfect. And and there's no place for me there. And it's something I need to work on a lot more. Um, I know we mentioned a bit about other type perspectives and I find ENFPs, uh, which we'd had before, I think partly because they understand where INFPs are coming from with, you know, like a strong connection with FI and NE, but the fact that they have a bit, or, bit more access to the TE, I think encourages them. And I like to, I mean, a very uh, prominent ENFP in our type community, uh, Heidi Preeb. Uh, she even has this pinned on her Twitter profile. Uh, and I'm quoting right here, reading it. Just do that thing you're afraid of. And if it doesn't work out, remember that we're all on a giant rock floating through space. And in 100 years, everyone you know who knows you will be dead. Uh, which is, I find, wonderfully uh, ENFP humor. And... Uh, it's a, I remember having a conversation with her where I said, oh, like, you know, I want to do like a YouTube channel and talk about like my own perspectives on things. And but then it was like, oh, my God, well, who's going to like watch this? Like, you know, and it's not that I wanted, oh, I need like a million subscribers or anything like that. I don't want to be a leader in that sense. But she 
I, I really appreciate her perspective on so many topics, but she, I remember her saying to me, like, like, even if, you know, something you put out there like matters to one or two or five, 10 people, like, how would you feel about that? It's like, well, that would be amazing. Like if, you know, a, a tiny fraction of people like are invested in or care about what I have to say. And, and it's, I've, I've found that's uh, really helped to fuel that fire in me um, where it's not about, it's not about the big wins or anything like that. It's not about like being an influencer, so to speak, or yeah, like the big boss or anything like that. Like if you can inspire even just, you know, a couple of people in anything you say or do, uh, that that's just, that's just magic in and of itself, uh, that would personally, like that would sustain me for years. I think about the negative things, like, it's like, oh, that one time I was awkward. Like the person, the, you know, my server told me to enjoy my meal. And I said, you too, uh, which I know is a very relatable human moment, but there's a thing where you like, you lie awake. It's like, oh, like five years later and thinking, oh my God, like, like, oh, like what the hell is wrong with me? I'm such a spaz. Take, take that. Sure. There's that moment. Fine. Accept it. Don't deny it or anything, but take the reverse of that. Take the time where like somebody said, you know, I really appreciated what you said. Like that, that really helped me a lot. And like focus more on those positive moments because they're there. And, and just like that can make it, that can make a real difference. And I think overall, like people prefer to focus on like the good things that have happened in their life. Like who's going to sit around, who's going to lie around on their deathbed thinking like of all the times they screwed up and stuff like that. Like you want to think about, you know, the things that, that really matter. And I know I'm rambling <laughs> quite a bit here and I apologize, but uh, I find that like finding small ways to uh, lead and inspire people like at work or even branching out into yeah, like more creative areas. Uh, I it's it's really meant meant a lot to me. Uh, there's times where I actually get quite emotional about it, and uh, I'm not gonna not gonna cry on camera <laughs> or anything like that. But I don't know. I don't know. I just find it's a very helpful perspective. So, well, Paul, Paul, if you had a YouTube channel, I'll definitely listen to a piece here really eloquent when and passionate and um, when you speak. And I think there's a lot of people that you can inspire for sure. Oh, thank yeah. you. Well, not, not to Bill and I haven't done anything with it yet, but I, I did create a channel called uh, One Fine Nine, like fine being F-I-N-E and me being a nine on the Enneagram, I figured I'd go with that because rhyming. Uh, so look, look for that, you know, coming up soon kids. <laughs> Yeah, you talked about how even just influencing one or five people would be amazing. And technically, we're in the panel right now, and you're influencing like five people already. So you already reached that milestone that was so precious. It's possible. So yeah, you're skilled. Put yourself out there. You got this. I will be you the You miscounted, people. Joyce. There's, there's six others besides Paul. <laughs> Sorry. I, 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 had, I had to step in. <laughs> see, I was testing your proofreading there, you know, just to see how you would notice the details. This is all a game. <laughs> I don't believe you, Joyce. You're an INFJ. That's not something you would do. <laughs> Paul, I just wanted to say I love what you said. Sometimes I uh, often I forget, but thinking about the one or two or five, however few people you can influence for the positive or, or help. Um, when I remember to think about that is when I can actually finish things. <laughs> so um, that's how I finished my book and published it. And for some of the organizing projects that I'm doing that are just part of my regular jobs, I'm not, you know, getting paid. It's not a separate organizing job. And they are really hard to finish. But if I can remember what you said about helping these, you know, five people that will be impacted by getting 
this done, um, it really does help me to get pushed through that last 20%, which is so difficult. And I have found this in many areas at work, um, but especially on projects that are long and involved and complicated and difficult. And I get tired of them and bored with them. Um, but knowing that I can help one or two or however many people, that's so, so valuable. And I just wanted to reinforce that um, it's been so helpful for me. And I think it can be helpful for other, not just INFPs either, you know, people in general. So thanks for reminding me. That's so beautiful. Something interesting you brought up, Dana, was the starting energy is there, but then when there are too many details and logistics, you start to get weighed down. That's why like NP types, there may be this strong like passion at the beginning, but to follow through, it requires you bearing the SI, you have to do the grind, the day to day. And you can't be beating yourself with FI and also completing it too. So it's like turning off the inner critic is pretty interesting. Like I'll have INFP friends and they have these projects that they're working on or stuff like maybe personal journal that they've been writing in. And whenever I tell them to put it out there, because I think it's really good, they're always like, well, I could see this, 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 that could be better about it. I'm not ready to put it out yet. And it's like, well, but it's great. But I, I never feel like I can change their mind about the topic because with FI, you are the ultimate authority to what you think or what you feel is good work or what you feel is the ideal. And no one outside of you can convince you that that it is good unless you yourself believe in it and you have come to that conclusion yourself. And so Paul also brought up this point about how there's this imposter syndrome within himself. And so oftentimes it can be hard to internalize this, but we all kind of know this, that life is like a dark room. We're all in this pitch black room and we're feeling around to know where we're going, but no one really knows what they're doing. They might have found like one pathway of doing things the way that they might like it. But then like most people are clueless about most things because we're all in the dark. And so I, I kind of like to keep that into perspective because it says that like, you really don't need to feel like anyone is better than you or higher than you. Because with the extroverted thinking and the inferior spot, what it might do is you'll see the hierarchy and you'll go like, ah, they're so high up the hierarchy and I'm so like not there in the hierarchy of um, being TE achieved. It helps to know that no one knows what the heck they're doing because we're all just headless chickens running around trying to be as composed as a headless chicken can be. So DJ and Ian, any thoughts? I was um, going to bring this up earlier, um, but going off of what Paul was saying, um, there was a, there was a time when like, when I was starting my job, my first job, um, I wasn't really engaging with people as much as I wanted to like you, it's kind of like, I, I feel like there's this, um, there was this disconnect from like what I should be doing versus what I want to be doing. And it's like, oh, you have to take like orders and like send it to the kitchen to make orders and things like that. And it's kind of like, okay, so you can't really talk to people on a more like intimate like deep level um and there was this um there was one night where i was like i forget what i was doing but there was um there was this gentleman who was um who was really like he was he was also working in customer service, but he had like, he was doing all these like, like Disney character voices and things like that. And, um, and I remember my dad asked him why he was doing that. And his answer was that um, you never really know what like someone's going through. 
So you can really like, you can really kind of personalize um, the ways that you interact with people. And it's something that like from that moment, like it was like a spark ignited and I went like, oh, okay. So I can like, I need to make this my own and like I can still engage with people and still have it be like authentic. And um, I think that's like what, like I, I nearly got fired because I wasn't talking to people and then, or engaging um, to, I ended up like being there for two months and I got like, um, like customer service of the year or something like that, uh, which was weird. And I still, to this day, I think it's like unnecessary, but, <laughs> um, but I, I always try to bring that with me to whatever I'm doing is um, you never really know what someone's going through. Um, so why not treat everyone like they're going through the worst day of their life and um, finding unique ways to engage with just everyone and make it very personal. Um, like I still make it personal, even though I work in a very like corporate environment. Um, I still try to, um, make it very personal and ask people how they're doing and ask people about their lives. I think people like that because like, it's, it's very overlooked in our society and, making people feel seen. Um, like if something, if something happened, like when I, when I worked in management, like if there was a situation that went down, I would like talk to both par parties individually and try to hear both sides before, like I never really come to conclusions about things, but um, I tried not making judgments as much as possible. Yeah. So it seems like one of your skills, Ian, is individualizing. I wonder if because INFPs know how complex they are internally, they don't want to overgeneralize you. So they actually want to understand your individual psychology because they know how complex they can be. Um, so I'm just going to invite Paul back into the, the room and sort y'all back into the... Uh, I, I like this game of sorting. It's like we're cards or something. <laughs> Sorry, the firefox kept crashing on me. <laughs> no worries, no worries. I, Ian, I, I thought that was like the, the story that you told is really beautiful and very relatable too. I think um, that's an important thing is that people do like the personal and people do like um, the vulnerable too. And I think um, introverted feeling could bring that out. And when we can understand that, you know, other people are vulnerable as well we could pick out that inner like feeling world of other people then we, it, it could kind of like relax us for sure so for example so i work in mental health counseling and with mental health counseling uh you might have like a free 15 minute consultation in the beginning and then they say like with that what you do is you collect the who where when what right and then you kind of like do the intake which is a lot of like um a lot of the facts, right? That's important. The issue is uh, you're not, with that, you're not gonna connect with anybody. These people are there because they're they're suffering or they're struggling in some sort of way. So I, I change that. So I give like a free 30 minute consultation and I don't go for who, where, when, what. I just basically treat it like a, a therapy session. I want to get to know them. And that definitely uh, really connects people. So it, it, it does make a difference. People, that's what people are looking for for sure. And on the other hand, when things are very not personalized and very co cookie cutter or very cold, detached or inhumane seeming because it doesn't consider the human element, FI can be put off by that. It's like, whoa, this is too cold, systematic, soulless, inorganic. And so DJ, any thoughts? Yeah, sure. Kind of just like jumping off of what like other people said in as far as like leadership goes. I mean, personally, I, I don't really want to lead anyone. I probably shouldn't be like managing anyone or any resources. Um, 
I'm not a particularly organized person or anything like that, but maybe like an offshoot of leadership is we could be very good at like um, cont contributing to the um, emotional health of a workplace and things like that. Like um, it makes me think of like Clifton Strengths and they have different domains. Um, I scored highest in the relationship building domain, which they generally described as the glue that holds teams together. So I could see how with our qualities, like um, Ian was talking about listening, seeing the individual, um, you know, the any having an open mind and things like that, and just general patience and flexibility and um, a natural interest in people and in encouraging them, how it could like draw people out to, you know, share their ideas or come out or, you know, feel seen and stuff like that and kind of help people um, come out because like, you know, Paul was saying no one really escapes um, imposter syndrome and things like that. So I think we can like contribute because there's so many like lonely people out there and I'm a pretty good active listener. So, I mean, there's people I've met where I'll sit there and I'll just listen to them. And they just, I think they just keep coming back because they just want someone to listen to them. I think there's just people starving and like disconnected and feeling seen or they don't feel encouraged. You know, it's just like, you really don't know, like Ian said, what's churning inside of someone, especially an introvert or something like that. You know, there's people who seem to have it all then like the next day they kill themselves, you know, so you really... <laughs> um don't know so i could see how we could do that kind of like be like the catalyst and like draw people out and um you know some other things too because there's kind of like a pattern of contradictions in all of us like um and one i think that comes out is we see problems but we're also kind of like optimists as well so we're like cynical optimists i've thought of myself as that where you know we could come to problems. This is a problem I've had where I pointed out problems, but I didn't bring any solutions. So it was just like a lot of complaining. But to kind of like manage that and just come there with like ideas and ways it could be better, and not turning away and things like that, um, could definitely contribute to like a more positive um, environment. So I think we could be like really negative and destructive in the emotional environment if we let our idealism run away, or we could really like contribute to it um without you know becoming too like unrealistic and things like that so maybe in that way and in influencing people but i'm definitely not going to show up and be like you have to do this do this now i'm just assigning tasks we're doing this i'm going to keep track of all the inventory um yeah i reserve all my yelling for my children so but in the workplace i don't yell i like to uh inform people like that behind the scenes thing, like here's a piece of information that might be helpful. I'm not gonna tell you at all what to do with it, but here it is, you know? So I'm definitely, I think do better in a behind the scenes supportive role. DJ mentions the confidant aspect of the NF types. That's one of their tropes. And so my next question for everyone is, what are some quirks you have in the workplace? Things that people notice about you? When we used to work, um in person, you know, like in the stone ages years ago, um, whenever I've been in uh, environments where like I had a desk or a place like that, people would always notice that I am um, biologically unable to have an organized desk. Like there's just so that the, the, my desk always looks like what I think of my any mind, you know, it's just like, like I know where everything is and it has an organization to it. And someone can say something and I can totally just put my hand on something, but to anyone else, it looks like, I don't know, like just a nightmare, like a, a tornado hit, you know, and there's just stuff everywhere. Um, so that, I think that's a quirk. Um, yeah, we, we like, yeah, I don't, I don't know that we're capable of having like, you know, like just, or like, like, and, and I can set it up, but I can't maintain it, you know? So if I clear out my desk, again, I'm actually, it makes me calm to have an outer um, organized, you know, um, environment without all the clutter. Um, and that is actually very calming, but then it's not very creative for me. So I struggle between those two polls um yeah that is funny and because um 
and I think this is only because I have part-time jobs now, uh, <laughs> people kind of make fun of me for being the quote unquote anal organized one and always wanting things to be tidy. Um, when I was, um, well, especially when I worked at the medical clinic, I would have days where I would just be like, I can't, I can't deal with this anymore. And I would clean it all off and get it really nice and organized. And then like you, I was there full time. So I could not for the life of me, I tried to, okay, 15 minutes before I leave, I'm going to get my desk all night. No, no, I could not do it. But now that I am part time in a lot of, well, two different places, um, I am kind of the queen of organizing and that is my big, what I am known for at the two places where I have workspaces. Um, but then that said, my desk at home, well, actually my desk at home right now is clean and we'll see how long it stays that way. I'm with you. I really want it that way. and It calms me down and it makes me feel like I'm in control. But I can't maintain it. Although I'm working on that. I, I'm trying a thing. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking about my quirks. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's one. And then they started stacking on top of each other. Uh, I, I don't know if this is a quirk. I mean, I certainly in our office have one of the more decorative, decorative cubicles. Uh, there's like a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, I've got like the photos and like photos of my wife and, you know, some stuff like that. But I've got stuff like posted up about like, you know, MBTI related or Enneagram related, which I know must look a bit weird in an engineering firm. Uh, <laughs> um, and then other things, things are actually a bit more personal because like uh, last month, of course, you know, corporate speaking was, you know, pride. And I actually came out like formally on LinkedIn as, uh, you know, being bisexual and gender fluid. So I still have like flags up and I figured, you know what, I'm just going to keep those up. Like, I don't care if it's not June anymore. Right. It's just like, you know, in June, like everyone changes their logos to a rainbow and <laughs> then, then they carry on business as usual. Um, in terms of other quirks, uh, I do enjoy writing about like on our company internet about events that are going on. Uh, not so much the projects we're working on, but just more social stuff. And I tend to have a very sarcastic sense of humor when it comes to that. Like I try not to be overly caustic or cynical, but like I'll, I'll or either that or I'll get so sarcastic where I describe like, you know, some mundane meeting as like this like epic meeting of minds and i'll use like all these superlatives where it's like oh my god like you know we are affecting global change <laughs> and stuff like that so you know where it's sarcastic but it's not meant to be mocking just more you know it's more fun to describe things that way i find uh but the last quirk and it's one i never really thought about and i don't know how well this comes off here but I'm known for having a very distinctive voice. And I do answer the phone from time to time. Uh, I'm, I'm in marketing, which is part of admin and admin tends to answer the phone. So there'll be a lot of like, sometimes like, good afternoon, Paul speaking, uh, how may I direct your call? And I never, it was really not deliberate or anything. I just kind of enjoyed like, you know, speaking in like a more drawly, relaxed, uh, and people would apparently comment to like, you know, they talk to the like partners or other engineers, whoever they were trying to call is like, yeah, who is that guy on the phone? Like, like, and stuff like that. And then finally people started like talking to me as like, you know, you, wow, like you should be on the radio and stuff. And it's like, well, I do have a face for it. So I can't help but be self-deprecating. But then there are other times where like a woman called up and she just starts giggling, right? And she's like, oh, wow, you have an amazing voice. And I was like, very professional. You should see the rest of me. <laughs> you know? and thankfully, she thought that was hilarious because it, on reflection, I thought, oh, gosh, I, I could really... I could potentially get in trouble for stuff like that, but uh, 
I do. I do just enjoy that aspect of it. It's not that I want to answer the phones all the time because you know, especially as an introvert, phone calls uh, not the number one <laughs> means of interaction in the world. But I, I, I kind of celebrate that little quirk of mine. Like, and I have no no plans on changing it or anything. I, I do enjoy welcoming people to uh, our little particular corner of the world uh, should they happen to call and uh you, you have me. another you have another reason paul to have uh to be confident in your youtube channel too Imagine that <laughs> voice. have you thought about being a voice actor i've th thought about it i live in vancouver which uh I, depending on how familiar you are with the film industry is known and no shade to toronto but is often called hollywood north uh i Sorry, I said I actually said Toronto. I'm supposed to say Toronto, otherwise it's not very Canadian. Um, <laughs> don't don't ask. Uh, yeah, so it's a very competitive industry. So there was that point that oh, that's too much work, and it's not like I have a strong desire to do it or anything like that. But it, it's fun. It's I think voice acting is phenomenal. Uh, I don't know why. There isn't more recognition for voice actors, even when it comes to like, like say the Academy Awards, because even though it's like, oh, you're just a voice, like there is so much that goes into like the nuance and like, especially the really acclaimed voice actors, like just the myriad characters they've created and how distinct they all are. And, and even they have their own range of emotional expressions. And again, I am rambling a little bit, but yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Leon. I really appreciate that. Yeah, you should just do the rest of that panel in your deep man voice. <laughs> Whatever you like, Joyce. <laughs> Not at all inappropriate. <laughs> I'm dead. Paul, you should do ASMR. That's what you could do on YouTube, you know? You'd probably get a lot of subscribers doing that. Should I just, just whisper like this so the entire time? Absolutely. Oh God, That's exactly so what you do. This is so odd. This is what you all need right now. <laughs> you can Thank charge you, extra for DJ. that. I appreciate that. <laughs> you can have an like an OnlyFans ASMR and then just like a, a regular one. You know? Okay, so this these are like INFP career tips. Only this fans. is wonderful marketing. I <laughs> I really appreciate this. Mm -hmm. Getting a demonstration of quirky right here. Yeah, the entrepreneur mm -hmm. is the INFP. You know, probably a lot of the stuff we want to do, we'd have to go out on our own. So you know, there you go. As ASMR, different versions, you know, and things like that. So. I love one where I just yell at people. <laughs> there's probably a market for that. Oh, yeah. Being verbally chastised. Trust me, there's a market for that. <laughs> you could whisper horrible things to people in German. That would be a new way for you to get in there. That would be how you differentiate yourself from your competitors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I find German is a really interesting language because, yeah, like there is that very like harsh commanding part, but there's also that very cheerful, like kind of like country milkmaid, like Guten Abend, you know what? Abend to you, at Herfen, and uh, that's complete nonsense. I do apologize to any uh, German people <laughs> or German speaking people in the world, uh, but yeah, I do, I do love the contrast there you get with German, where. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it can be a very harsh. Well, 70% of German is just clearing your throat, really. So you could just like <laughs> quietly clear your throat for like an hour and people could just try to like relax to it. So that's right. We can say this as English speakers because it's, of course, a Germanic language. So it's okay if we like make fun of German. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Totally, ta totally talking about INFP crews. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and bringing our little ESTJ German, you know, our little Darth Vader. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wait, Darth Vader is German? Wow. There's so well, many he's an ESTJ and all ESTJs are German. So, oh, of course. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> he gets Obviously. things done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, just some things about INFPs that are like happening in real time right now that, you know, in terms of quirks, it's like, I think sarcasm rules, but a lot of people don't know that. You know, I mean, INFPs just have a wicked, um, sarcastic sense of humor but then 
you, you know, I mean, DJ, you're just going for it, just letting it rip, which is, is it, it's like a guilty pleasure almost. And Paul, you're like trying to pull it back a little bit with like FI, like, but I don't want to offend that, you know, and we do that, right? Like, but so we're somewhere on the spectrum of like just letting it rip and or being conscientious about, you know, how we might affect other people. But I don't think a lot of people know how funny INFPs can be because, you know, introversion, we don't let it out um, except in certain safe environments or with safe and safe relationships or safe whatever. Um, and that just reminded me of a lot of things that have been talked about, imposter syndrome, authenticity, making it our own you know, stuff like that. So I just wanted to say, like, especially for any younger career people who might watch this at some point, um, just, I, and I don't know if this is INFP in general, I think it is, but at least my own experience, like early on, like I found, you know, as a young person, it was really hard to be an FI dominant um, or, or, you know, INFP, because I don't know if this really applies to ISFPs, but because it is such a, a, a personal, like very personal, um, you know, Dana, you had said personal before, but, and, and Ian, you had said intimacy, you know, intimate. It's, it's like, it's like you literally, you know, that thing, your heart on your sleeve and all of that. Like, it's like, it's like you walk around with this level of like openness, boundarylessness, and intimacy that you have no ability to do anything about. That's just how you are. It's how you're wired, right? You walk in the world this way. So then, of course, we have to, you know, use sarcasm and all these other things to kind of block and defend and do stuff. But, but so we have to be really careful and discerning about who we let in because there aren't defense mechanisms, you know, and because the core of who we are, you know, that FI is, um, uh, you know, it's so sensitive, like its superpower is in its sensitivity, like it can pick up nuances in uh, emotional currents and what's going on inside of another person, you know, like they would make a lot of INFPs just brilliant psychologists and things like that. But, but experiencing the world that way and other people that way all the time, like the world and other people don't take care, you know, th there's no care taken or awareness taken of that. So we are like very much in a certain way, we go out in the world and we're, you know, like, um, what is that thing? Like a, a bear in a China shop or something. Like we're like, you know, there's a fragility in that, you know, because we can get destroyed. Like our hearts can be, obliterated, you know, very easily. But then also I find that we have this incredible resilience around emotional issues and stuff because we're just dealing with them all the time. So as you get older, you just have this incredible resilience. Um, but in terms of the imposter complex, at least for me in my experience, I ex have experienced it less and less as I've aged because, um, you know, as a very young person, um, it was like, it was not only the, the FI, you know, looking for the ideal and, and being able to, to, you know, proofread or troubleshoot the gap in myself of like, well, I'm not there yet to like be talking about this or whatever, uh, or working in this capacity, or I don't have the experience, you know, um, because INFPs are really brilliant at like sort of going from like kindergarten to graduate school in one fell swoop, like because we can conceptually understand something in its whole. And sometimes that gives us insights into things where we know we have no business because we don't have experience, we don't have the resume or whatever, but it doesn't mean that we can't be good contributors. And now I'm doing the rambling that you talk about, Paul, but I'll, 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 I'll bring it back in. But um, uh, in terms of that imposter complex, right? Like it's like, it's also a matter of not just, you know, in terms of how much we know or what do we have the resume, but it's also, you know, the way that FI feels and experiences in the world. Like, you know, I, you want to hold everything really close to the, to the, to the vest. Like you don't want to self-disclose. Like FE is really self-discloses in really amazing ways. And that's how FE connects a lot with other people. And sometimes FI, you know, you just meet an FE person, whatever they're self-disclosing and you're like, you know, it's like that because it's like, you would never like self-disclose something so intimate and so personal and so close 
to your heart, like right off the bat, like, or if you did, it's something that you've rehearsed or you're really comfortable with or whatever. But as a young person, you, you know, you kind of hold that all back and then you learn how to work with that, you know, as you get older. So, um, so just in a workplace in particular, a lot of people don't get to know what an I, you know, an INFP in that intimate way and in that way where all the stuff rips like the sarcastic humor or this or that or the other thing. And a lot of people, you know, that's why, you know, sometimes we're um, coined as like mysterious or this or that, you know, and, you know, still waters run deep and all that kind of stuff that is the tropes that are thrown out. Um, but it's because having to have a certain level of shielding just to walk and function in the world. And if you're young, you need a lot more of it than you do after you've been tempered and kind of been out in the world and figured out how to, how to work with yourself. So I hope that brought it around. It wasn't just total rambling. Yeah, no, that absolutely, that was really, really insightful. Wondering about DJ Ian, about your quirks. And I think Leon hasn't shared yet too. So if you want to share, you can Oh, share. that's because I don't have any Joyce. You know, I'm a, I'm a perfect human being. <laughs> so, oh, but uh, I think one thing is like you could say like expert intuition kind of has a quirk. And so a lot of people, when they think about introvert sensing, they think of someone who's like very repetitive or like stuck in the past or something like that. But it's not necessarily true. Like if they're very well developed, someone with introvert sensing, they because they build good habits, um, they kind of build from the ground up, right? They start with what works and then they start to build and they, they have enough sufficient expert intuition and it's a interest in exploring, then they could really test out possibilities in a very introvert sensing kind of way. I think like if an expert intuiting type is very undeveloped is that we often repeat the same mistakes because we forgot, like we get interested in a possibility and we, we kind of go into it and, we've, and then we do it again because we forgot last time how it, it did not work. So we, we, we might just end up going around in circles. Um, right. Um, so how that, like, like when I'm thinking about work, I think something that INPs could learn is like to be able to build that introvert sensing. For instance, like um, from work, there, work is a place where you use introvert sensing, you use expert thinking. And I found that it helps with my writing. So I write outside of work and I learned that with that consistency and learning to show up. So like kind of like how you show up for work. If I show up for writing the same kind of way, it's much easier to do. I can't uh, completely rely on passion. Yeah, that is a good way of putting it, Leon. Yeah, it does SI justice. And so it's good because a lot of people tend to describe SI in a one dimensional way. So you added some complexity to it. DJ and Ian? I, I would say one of my quirks is going off of what I said earlier is mainly um, getting too personal with people when it's not really the best time. Like TE and FI kind of work against each other in that way where TE wants to get something done while FI wants to kind of spend some time understanding and dialing down to the emotional nuance of things. And um, it's like when you get both of those combined, it's like, oh, I, I need to do this, but I also need to get this done. And um, so I might be talking to someone for like two hours and like they had their foods like cold by now and things like that. <laughs> but yeah, and Going back to what other people said, definitely organization is not the best. I have um, I have monthly and quor quarterly meetings with my manager, who's also an INFP, ironically, um, where the one thing that constantly gets brought up is organization, <laughs> but I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah, I guess some of my quirks that I've, I've heard about is like, um, is humor. That's probably the one thing because as I've grown more confident, I'm I just make a lot of jokes, whether people want to hear them or not. Like I'm just making it. And so that's one thing I've received until like um, from an exit interview at a internship, she was like, you might want to dial back the humor. It might get you in trouble. But even, I've, even though I've dialed it back, it's still um, 
something that people say about me. Um, and I guess I would say like other stuff, like people, managers have told me I need to like maybe speak up more or uh, trust myself more um, or I have to work faster because I'm not very efficient. I'm not necessarily blazing through. I was getting trained on a procedure recently and she's the woman training me was like, yeah, you're going to have to work faster. So <laughs> uh, I'm not always like the efficient. I don't have like that TE motto of like, let's just get this over with always you know it's kind of like i can do that more detailed stuff but i can't necessarily do it like super quickly as well so i guess those are just um some of mine yeah there should be a type talks episode with just you dj and paul and you're just riffing off of each other's jokes mercilessly do you guys find that you tend to be the one that people come to to solve business or personal problems like, or not even to solve them, just to let them vent. Because I seem to recall playing that role in most of the um, work situations that I've had. Always, even strangers coming up to me and in two minutes telling me their life story, like, or what a pro like, always, always. Yeah, I've, I've had that. Like, never work problems, but like, um, people just bringing up things about their lives, you know, that, like you said, you don't even know them very well. And they're like, like, I'm thinking of leaving my husband. It's like, oh, great. <laughs> it's like, and it's not little things like, you know, Jimmy didn't put the pens away or something. It's like kind of like heavy stuff that they bring up. And it's like, I have no idea what to say to you. But I, like you said, I think they just want to be listened to. So. Yeah, the INFP, the unpaid therapist of the workplace. Yeah, and this is coming from an INFJ <laughs> who, yeah, are apparently often very put much put upon. I think it's more about solving problems in that case. But yeah, I I do get a bit do get a bit of that. Like, yeah, where it's more just people just yeah want basically a space to like vent or just talk about or share things. But yeah, Ian, you reminded me about yeah the desire to get personal with people. Um, I work with an ENTJ who is fantastic, right? I mean, but he's like a border collie, for example. So it's like, oh, like, yeah, we're getting all these things done and visions and and tasks and all that stuff. So he, and he has a great sense of humor and, and we enjoy like, you know, like we'll be in a meeting in his office and, you know, he'll be like talking about things, but then suddenly he's done, right? And he's off to the next thing. And meanwhile, I'm like, oh, oh, I was almost there, you know? Like, because I was enjoying, I was enjoying that feeling of connection and sharing things and bantering, and and then it's like, oh, oh, so you're satisfied, but here I am still, like, still pent up, and, um, y you know, like I, I don't know if anyone can relate to that experience. It's probably just me, but it's like, oh, well, that's typical. Now I have to like go off and like take care of it myself. Uh, <laughs> um. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that this has no uh, context or nuance whatsoever, and uh, we will uh, move on. Thank you. No, Paul, that's really important. I think, you know, connection is the word that came up that just jumped out, right? I, I feel like we're wired for connection, and we're not wired for, like, you know, the stereotypical, like, parallel play that, like, toddlers do or that, like, anyway, I won't say, but, but, uh, you know, where like connection where you have like shared interests. Oh, you know, I'm going to go to this is my football game friend or this is my this friend. Like we want intimacy. Like we want and we want to know somebody and we want to be known. But that's harder. Um, so, yeah, it's like connection is a watchword for for INFP. And we look for it everywhere. You know, unfortunately, even in inappropriate places or in a public relationship or like, you know, even at work or whatever, where, you know, that's not really the name of the game, but it's, it's what compels us. It's what drives us. We're, we're like wired for connection. Exacto mundo. And that's why Kirzy calls the NF types that they have this soulmate seeking missile inside them that wants to have a genuine real connection with someone to know them soul to soul, heart to heart, concept to concept, to know the, the heart of you. And so thanks INFPs for coming out today. It was a pleasure to hear your bantering, your humor, your back and forth, the rambling, the tangents, and the very deep thoughts that were interspersed throughout this conversation. 
it's quite humorous to learn about the disorganized us and the workplace quirks that you all have. I appreciated your desire to get personal with people and to seek out true intimacy. I think that's wonderful because that's how you really get to know someone. Like there's the fluff and then there's the fronting someone can put up, but you want to know what's beyond that. And that's commendable because that's what truly matters in life. Because when you don't have that, then you really have nothing. So you know what matters in life. And so, yeah, thanks Anne for coming out. And I appreciate your work with depth typology that I'm excited to feature. You're a powerhouse of INFP insights. And then whenever you compliment INFPs, they're like, oh, I'm going to make a cringy face because I don't know if I oh, couldn't, couldn't stop myself in time. But yeah. <laughs> thank you. I'll just be gracious and say thank you. But yeah, I couldn't stop the cringy face. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah right. An INFP thing. Yeah. It's like, I don't see myself that way. <laughs> yeah. So thanks, DJ, for your offbeat sense of humor. It's really funny. INFP humor also has a little bit of self-deprecation to it too, as you see. They know how to poke fun at themselves too. And so thanks Paul for your sexy voice. And we got to hear a little bit of it. It's very provocative and titillating. <laughs> and very fun. Joyce. You, just, <laughs> you, you have my private number. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so that was hilarious. I'm, I'm dead. <laughs> That's your next career option if nothing else works out. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but yeah, both Paul and DJ, you're extremely funny. Like, laugh until you cry, kind of funny. And so, Ian, thanks for coming out and your customer of the year. It made you feel so cringe winning that. When you described it, you're like, it's so weird. And I'm like, those are like the mini micro FI reactions. Like FI will seep in in little cues. It'll be like, oh, like you'll know when Anne makes a little cringing face or like Ian makes the, oh, that was weird kind of comments, like side comments, you'll see FI seeping out. Yeah, that and um, I, there was one time where like I was showing a film or no, it was a commercial that I made for a daycare. And it like we watched commercials all night, and then this one came up, and it was like it got a standing ovation. I'm like, it was even that great. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, but that's a good lesson for all of us to hear. You know, not that it's going to change how we feel about it, but it's like you know, even the stuff that we put out there that we think's mediocre or not quite meeting the standard, like you know, a lot of times can be you know, really hailed by other people as like, oh, this is awesome, right? Like, or the, 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 you know, employee of the month or whatever, you know, the customer service person, like whatever you got, like, you're like, what, what? I wasn't doing anything, you know? But we have to remember that as INFPs, like really remember that, that like, you know, that like even, you know, our, our, our standard is up here. So we're putting out something up here and that's still like, you know, really incredible stuff. So, or at least I, I talking it. I have, to, I have to. I have to remember that. You know, um, for myself. I feel like whether we want to see it or not, it's kind of like um, life is like a ginormous stack of dominoes, and it's always falling and topping over, so, and going off to different trails and things like that. So you never really know what impact you had on someone's life, but it could be a pretty big impact. Yeah, you could be the pivotal moment that changes everything for someone. I know my INFP friend was the pivotal moment for a lot of changes in my life. And Leon, thanks for being the actual paid therapist out of all of these therapists. <laughs> Yes, it's, it's really great to be on this channel. It's always a good time. Awesome. And so thanks, everyone, for watching. I'll see you all in the next episode. Bye. Mm -hmm.